Okay. Welcome, everybody. Welcome to the NASA Earth Day Webinar, Fellowship Opportunities with the NASA Postdoctoral Program. This is your host, Jennifer Brennan. So most of you, you know, you're already logged in, but while others are still logging in, we do have two polls at the bottom left and middle hand side of your screen that I'd like you to take a moment to answer if you could. I've got 10 a.m. Eastern Daylight Savings Time, so we're going to go ahead and get started. So as I said, I'm your host, Jennifer Brennan. I am also the NASA Earth Observing System Data Information System User Support and Communications Lead at NASA Goddard Space Flight Center. So I'd like to begin by going over a few housekeeping items related to this webinar. First, due to the large number of participants and to ensure best audio experience, the conference has been placed in silent mode. However, if you have any issues or questions throughout, please enter them into the Q&A pod right here in the lower right-hand corner of your screen. Okay, this works like a chat. This webinar will be recorded and posted to our Earth Data Adobe Connect catalog, as well as to our NASA Earth Data YouTube channel. The URL will be provided on a slide at the end. All presentation files will also be available for your download at the end of the webinar. The webinar itself is one hour long. 45 minutes are allocated to the presentation and live demonstration, and then 15 minutes for the question and answer period. After the speaker has finished his presentation, we will then move to the final set of polling questions. So basically, the question and answer period follows directly after the final set of polling questions. So make sure you stay on the line and or stay in the room if you're interested in participating in the Q&A period. And we will take all of those questions um, you know, through the Q&A pod. We will not answer them verbally, as I mentioned earlier. So you have an opportunity to ask all questions throughout, and you know, they will be persistent. All questions asked in the beginning will still maintain um, in that log for the end of the webinar. Okay, except during the live demonstration, you will not be able to ask questions in that pod during that time period. Okay, uh, the raising hand function has been disabled again due to the large number of participants, but we will take all questions at the end. And just one final note: depending upon the volume of questions that are received, we will extend the Q&A period an additional 15 minutes to 11:15 a.m. for those of you who wish to stay on the line. So let's move next to the agenda. Okay, let me pull this up here. Okay, so the first 30 minutes or so will provide you with an introduction to the NASA, NASA postdoctoral program, eligibility requirements, award details, the selection process, and evaluation details. Um, during the next 15 minutes or so, we will switch over to the live demonstration where our speaker will guide you through the application process. It is my pleasure to introduce our speaker today, Dr. Larry who is the Director Emeritus for the NASA Postdoctoral Program. Larry? Thank you, Jennifer. And thank you for the opportunity to present information about the NASA Postdoctoral Program today. And thank you all for signing on today to participate in this webinar. Even though we can't interact verbally today, I encourage you to submit your comments or questions into the Q&A pod of the webinar website. As Jennifer indicated, your questions will be addressed at the end of this presentation. Now, I, I assume today that many of you are online, are, are today are just recent graduates or will soon receive your PhD degree, and you're considering a postdoctoral fellowship to begin your career. Therefore, before I begin the presentation itself, I'd like to comment a little bit about my background to give you an idea about where your career may lead someday. I received a Bachelor of Science degree in biology from the University of Minnesota in 1970, a long time ago, and a PhD degree from North Dakota State University in 1976 with an emphasis on terrestrial ecology. For much of my career, I was employed by Oak Ridge National Laboratory. That's the U.S. Department of Energy facility located in Oak Ridge, Tennessee. While there, I had the opportunity to work on a variety of environmental science projects 
and I served as the director of the NASA Distributed Active Archive Center for Biogeochemical Dynamics for 13 years. So for much of my career, I was in a position of supporting research by making environmental data available via the internet to investigators throughout the world. I was given the opportunity to support research in a different way when I left Oak Ridge National Lab to become the director of the NASA postdoc program. The NASA postdoctoral program, or NPP, is administered by Oak Ridge Associated Universities. I served as the NPP director until I retired in 2009. And then after a short period of retirement, I just couldn't stay away, so I returned to work in a part-time capacity to recruit applicants for the NASA postdoctoral program. Okay then, with, with that background, I'll begin my presentation for today. The objective of the NASA postdoctoral program is to recruit, evaluate, and support highly qualified postdocs to support NASA's mission of space exploration and scientific discoveries in virtually all of NASA's scientific and engineering disciplines. And this includes Earth science, planetary science, heliophysics, astrophysics, astrobiology, space bioscience, aeronautics and engineering, and finally, human exploration. All NASA centers, as well as NASA headquarters, participate in this program. The vast majority of the fellowships are supported by NASA's Science Mission Directorate, which encompasses the Earth science and all space science disciplines. There are two components of the NPP. First of all, we have the NASA Postdoctoral Research Program and the NASA Postdoctoral Management Program. All of the fellowships are in resident positions, whether they're at a NASA center or at NASA headquarters. The award is treated much like a grant, but instead of taking the grant money to a university or some other research organization, you perform the research at the NASA center right alongside the NASA advisor and his or her team of investigators that you choose to work with. As you might expect, the vast, the vast majority of the fellowship awards are within the research program. Now, to be eligible for the NASA postdoc management program, you must serve at least one year in the research program. Fellowships are competitively awarded, with the applications being reviewed initially by NASA and then by a three peer reviewers. I'll speak about the review process a little bit later. There are three application deadlines each year. March 1st, July 1st, and November 1st. We recommend that you apply about six months before you would like to begin the fellowship. Now, it, it takes about two months to have the applications reviewed, and the NASA Center may take another month or so to decide who they select for the awards. If you are selected for a fellowship, NASA will ask you to identify a start date over the next several weeks or months. NASA recognizes that everyone has lives and can't always accurately determine at the time you apply when you will be ready to start the fellowship. Therefore, the start date of the fellowship is determined by the applicant and the NASA advisor following the fellowship offer. NASA will wait several months for someone to join the fellowship, but of course, it's not open-ended. How long they wait depends on their research needs. Now, the NPP is really a very large program. It awards about 90 new fellowships every year. So I suppose right now some of you are wondering, are you eligible for a fellowship? Of course, as expected, the fellowships are open to U.S. citizens, but they are also available to those foreign nationals who are able to get a J-1 visa status as a research scholar, or to foreign nationals who are lawful permanent residents, you know, those folks who hold a green card. Now, occasionally, foreign national applicants may ask if they can hold a 
fellowship with an H-1B visa status. Well, an H-1B status is not acceptable in this program because that's an employment visa, and NPP is not an employment program. NPP fellows are not employees of NASA, nor are they employees of Oak Ridge Associated Universities, and they cannot be considered to be self-employed. As opposed to the concept of winning an award or winning a fellowship, results in different tax implications. Tax obligations on the fellowship stipend are described on the NPP website. Now, most, if not all, foreign nationals attending a U.S. university hold an F-1 status, visa status. You are eligible to apply for an NPP fellowship while holding your F-1 status. Then if you are selected for a fellowship, then you must change your status from an F-1 to a J-1 status as a research scholar before beginning the appointment. This is really not a very difficult process. The Goddard Space Flight Center recently announced that they cannot accept applications from citizens of, quote, designated countries unless they are lawful permanent residents of the U.S. Now, the link to the designated countries list is given on this slide, but don't worry about copying that link down now because this presentation can be downloaded from the webinar website following the presentation. Now, the fellowships are open to anyone regardless of when the PhD was received. Fellowship recipients who received a PhD degree less than five years ago at the time of the application are referred to as postdoctoral fellows. Fellowship recipients who received the PhD degree more than five years ago at the time of application are referred to as senior fellows. Now the primary difference in the two categories is that stipends for senior fellows are figured a little differently than for, than for the postdoctoral fellows. Awards are based on NASA's research priorities, the quality of the application, and availability of funding. For example, if a center receives an application that gets a very high score, that applicant might be offered a fellowship even if the research topic for that, for that application is a lower research priority for NASA. Likewise, NASA may or may not select an applicant for a high research priority if the applications are not of sufficient quality. As I said earlier, selection of an applicant for a fellowship depends on a combination of NASA's priorities, the quality of the applications, and how much funding they have. Now, the fellowship appointments are granted for one year at a time in accordance with the federal annual budget. Of course, NASA fully recognizes that you can't accomplish much in only one year, so they fully expect to extend the appointment for a second year. And about 20% of the fellowships are extended to a third year. In most cases, the first two years of the fellowship are supported by programmatic funds, while the third year is supported by the NASA advisor. Annual stipends start at $53,500 per year, with supplements for high cost of living areas. For example, the annual stipend for postdocs at the Goddard Space Flight Center in Greenbelt, Maryland is about $58,800. The stipend at the Ames Research Center in California, which has the highest cost of living for all NASA centers, is $64,000. $700. So it varies quite a bit depending upon what area of the country that you're going to be uh, residing in or which NASA center you're going to be working at. The program has a very generous relocation allowance, whether it's moving someone within the U.S. or from a foreign country. Foreign nationals who are moved by the program to the U.S. to begin the appointment also receive financial assistance to move back to their country following the fellowship appointment. Now, a really great part of the award is being able to travel to conferences to present your research and to collaborate with researchers where, wherever they are. Each NPP fellow receives a travel budget of $8,000 per appointment year. Quite likely, you use all of that travel budget in the first year because it takes time just to get settled into a new place and you're just beginning to collect your research data. Travel funds that aren't used 
used in the first year carry over to the second year. For example, let's say you spend only half of the $8,000 travel budget in the first year. Then on the first day of the second year of your appointment, your travel budget is increased by another $8,000. So now you have $12,000 travel budget for the second year. Of course, that's the time in which you're going to have lots more data and you're going to be traveling to conferences to present your results. Now your NASA Center reviews and approves travel requests. You just can't decide you want to just go uh, back to your home country for a visit. This is all research related money uh, for travel. So your NASA Center reviews and approves your request to make, tr make a trip. And our office assists you in making travel arrangements, ensuring that your travel is, is in accordance with all U.S. federal travel regulations. Fellows must have health insurance. If you don't already have a health insurance policy, you can purchase it through the program, and if you do that, then NASA pays about 85% of the insurance premiums, another great benefit. So where do I begin? The first step in finding out if MPP is for you is to search the research opportunities. There are more than 700 opportunities posted on the NPP website. I'll provide a short demonstration on that part of the website at the end of the presentation. Now, when you find a research opportunity that matches your skills and interests, you should contact the NASA adv advisor associated with that opportunity. Email addresses and phone numbers are provided online with every research opportunity. You can introduce yourself to the advisor. Let him or her know what you've been working on and that you read their research opportunity on the NPP website. The advisor can provide more specific information on his or her current research and available technical facilities at the center. And he or she can offer scientific advice that can help you develop a research proposal which you prepare as part of your application. If you get a, re if you get a positive re reply from the advisor, then you simply begin your application. You may apply for one of the opportunities per application cycle. The applications are completed online, and as I indicated earlier, we suggest that you apply about six months before you would like to begin the fellowship. Okay, how do I apply? As indicated on the previous slide, that the application is completed completely online. It's a web-based application in which you fill out some forms that ask for your name and contact information, education history, honors and awards that you've received, any employment you've had, citizenship information, and demographic information. You will also be prompted to provide your dissertation abstract, that's required for postdocs only, a statement of your research experience, and a list of your publications. Now one of the key components of the application is writing a research proposal. The research you propose should be your own unique ideas but needs to be compatible with the research opportunity you selected from the NPP website. As an NPP fellow, you will perform your own research, not that of your NPP advisor. However, like most research projects, once you begin your fellowship appointment, it's not uncommon for fellows to collaborate with their advisor and other members of the research team on multiple projects. The proposal should contain a brief abstract followed by the body of the proposal, which should contain a statement of the problem, the background and relevance to previous work, general methodology, that is, the procedures to be followed, and schedule, explanation of new or unusual techniques, expected results and significance, why is it important to NASA, and, of course, then literature citations and figures and charts where appropriate. Format specifications for all of the documents required for the application are defined on the, on the website. For example, the maximum length of the proposal is 15 pages, including figures and citations, double-spaced, 12-point font. Now, the format requirements may seem overly detailed, but it's important to follow the application instructions exactly so that all applicants are treated equally. Three references are required for the application, which is also completed online, making it very easy for your references to provide their recommendations. 
However, don't wait until the last moment to identify your references because as researchers themselves, they are often very busy. What your references say about you is a very important part of the application, so you want to give them plenty of time to provide their input. It is the applicant's responsibility to make sure the references provide their input by the application deadline. If you are applying as a postdoc applicant, as opposed to a senior level applicant, then one of the references must be from your PhD thesis or dissertation advisor. Graduate degree transcripts are required from all postdoc applicants and must be sent directly from the granting institution to our office. Senior level applicants are not required to submit transcripts. I'll say quite a bit more about the transcripts when I demonstrate the application. Now the applicant can log back into the application website at any time to check on the status of the transcripts, that is to see if we've received them, and also then to ensure that your references have provided their input. You won't be able to see what the reference said about you, but you can see if he or she has submitted the recommendation. You can see that some ref if you see that some references are missing, you can then contact those people to encourage them to submit their recommendation before the application deadline. You will not be able to submit your application until all parts of the application have been completed, including the three references, so you really need to stay on top of that. How will my application be evaluated? Well, the applications are subjected to a two-stage review. <clears throat> the application is first reviewed by the NASA Center for Suitability. For example, the center will look at it and say, are the proposed objectives realistic? Does the proposal reflect innovative thinking? Is the technical work plan sound and does it incorporate state-of-the-art methods? Can the research be accomplished in the proposed time frame? Does proposed research have relevance, relevance to NASA's mission? Well, applications that are considered to be suitable by NASA are then reviewed by at least three peer reviewers. The peer reviewers score the application and provide comments according to the four criteria listed here. The scientific merit of the proposed research accounts for 40% of the application score. What your references say about you accounts for 20% of the score. Your academic and research record, that is your transcripts and publication record, account for 20%, and then the final 20% of the application score is based on what the NASA Center says about your application. The review results are provided to the NASA Centers approximately two months after the application deadline. Each NASA Center gets the results for their center only, and each center decides who will receive a fellowship offer, which may take a few weeks. So if you apply by the next application deadline, which is July 1st, just a few days away, it's getting close, you will be notified about the results of the application sometime in September. This slide shows the number of fellows by fiscal year for the past several years. The program is very strong as evidenced by its growth. We've seen a 43% increase in the number of fellowship appointments over the past six years, going from 145 today to 100, 208. And of course, the number of applicants is also increasing. We've had a 120% increase in the number of applicants over the past six years. So, what does this mean about your chance of receiving an award? Well, we currently receive about 550 applications a year, and we make approximately 90 new awards a year, so your chance of being selected for a fellowship is about one in six. That's really very good odds. The program is a win-win situation for everyone. The NPP advisor gets the expertise of highly trained individuals from around, around the world to support their research needs. NASA headquarters gets the recognition of top-notch research by generating numerous high-quality publications, awards, and patents, and they are able to generate a pipeline of potential employees for the agency. And lastly, the NPP fellow receives an opportunity to interact with and learn from some of the nation's brightest scientists. 
So if you have questions so far about anything I've presented, now would be the time to enter them into the Q&A pod, Q pod of the webinar website, and we will address those questions following the presentation. Also, if you have any questions as you prepare your application, please don't hesitate to contact us. Our contact information is on the MPP website. We're here to help you through the process, and if you have questions, we're happy to help. Now I'm going to describe a little bit about the makeup or content of the program. That is, how many fellows are in the program by scientific discipline and center, the significant accomplishments of the program, and why the program is a benefit to you and NASA. Because we have fellows beginning and ending their appointments throughout the year, the number of fellows in the program varies daily. As of May 31st, shown on this chart, just a few days ago, we had 210 fellows in the program and 879 since inception. The overwhelming majority of the fellows are supported by NASA's Science Mission Directorate. You know, that's the one that support, encompasses Earth science and various science, space science disciplines. Currently, 79% of the 200 and fellows, 210 fellows, are supported by the Science Mission Directorate and 83% since inception. Other NASA directorates and disciplines have a small but still very effective part of the program. The number of NPP fellows by center is shown in this slide. We currently have 210 fellows located at nine NASA facilities in various NASA Astrobiology Institute locations. The Goddard Space Flight Center has the majority of the fellows, with 35% of the total, followed by the Jet Propulsion Lab and the Ames Research Center, each with approximately 20% of the total. Then the Astrobiology Institute has 8% and a handful of fellows at each of the other NASA centers. This breakdown generally reflects the overall science mission directorate funding and other sources of, sources of funding at the centers. Approximately 93% of the fellows are classified as postdoctoral fellows, and 7% are seniors. Approximately 57% of the fellows are U.S. citizens with foreign nationals accounting for 43% of the fellowship positions. So what do the fellows do after they complete their appointments? Where are they now? We survey, we survey the fellows as they complete their appointment, asking what they will be doing next. Based on these surveys, 40% of the fellows continue to work at the NASA Center, either as a civil servant that is hired by NASA, or as a contractor serving that NASA Center. This has been a consistent pattern over the years. So you can see the program is, in an excellent, is an excellent way for NASA to try someone out and for someone to try out NASA before making a longer term commitment. 25% of, of the fellows ending their appointments in 2013 were hired by colleges or universities and 21% since the inception of the program. 14% accepted another postdoc appointment from the, uh, from the fellows who turned in 2013, and 13% went on for another postdoc appointment at another institution when we look at all years. And a small fraction, as shown here, took a position at another government facility, industry, or nonprofit organization. Now, a couple of other interesting statistics which are not shown on this slide are 83% of the fellows, a very high percentage, accepted employment that is identical to or an extension of their NP research. And 9% of the fellows believe that the NPP enhanced their development as a scientist. Now, the NPP fellowships result in several significant accomplishments. The number of publications in peer-reviewed journals as a result of the fellowship research is very impressive. There were 215 publications in peer-reviewed journals generated by those who completed their appointment in 2013 and over 1,400 peer-reviewed pubs since the inception of the program. Now, the number of books, book chapters, and other publications was 84 in 2013 and 422 since the beginning of the program. 
the number of presentations has generally been a little bit more than two times the number of publications. As I said earlier, the fellowship provides a generous travel budget because NASA encourages the fellows to attend scientific conferences, to present their research results, and to network with people. Building your publication list and connecting with others will lead to employment opportunities. Many of the fellows receive national and international awards for their work and service to the community, with 34 awards received by those fellows completing their fellowships this past year and 175 since inception of the program. Those awards are documented on the NCP website. Finally, two patent applications were filed by fellows who completed their appointments last year, and there have been 23 patents filed by fellows since the beginning of the program. 11 of the 23 to date were filed by MPP fellows funded by the Science Mission Directorate. You remember again, now that's the Earth Science and space science disciplines. For example, Christina Stam, an NPP fellow shown here, supported by the Science Mission Directorate at the NASA Jet Propulsion Lab, applied for a patent regarding methods of discerning the viable bio burden in low biomass samples. Now, I'm going to end the slide part of my presentation today by showing you just a few things that the NASA advisors and fellows have said about the program. One of the advisors commented, the NASA postdoctoral program is a first-rate program and a jewel in NASA's crown. Another stated, this is an excellent program with a long track record of success. And another, I am extremely impressed with this program. Only suggestion is to figure out some way to grow this excellent program for the training of more young scientists. And as you've seen in this presentation, the program has been at a very fast pace. Now, we received numerous comments like this from the advisors every year. We're also very pleased with the program. Excuse me. I'll get back on track here. There we go. Fellows are also very pleased with the program as indicated by their comments. One fellow stated, I like that I'm given the freedom to pursue research in a field that I am truly interested in and to have the opportunity to collaborate with some of the best scientists in my field. Another comment commented, NPT provides an outlet to network with very high profile scientists. You will find yourself involved in a diversity of research projects that expose you to new exciting angles to your science. And the third one I have listed here states, the program offers an excellent opportunity to interact with and learn from some of the nation's brightest scientists as well as participate in cutting edge scientific and technological research. Now you can find lists of all NPP fellows, the titles of their research, their center affiliations, and the advisors they worked with on the NPP website. Now I'm going to switch to a demonstration of the NPP website just to show you how easy it is to apply. I'll be commenting on the home page the research opportunities catalog, and the procedures for applying. I'm going to switch over to another screen now. PP website is really a pretty simple website, but it's packed with information about the research opportunities NASA provides to postdocs as well as to senior researchers who are looking for an in-resident short-term research collaboration with NASA. What you're seeing here is the home page, and as we scroll down, you'll see that it contains a brief st statement of purpose, various links in a quick links box over here on the left, and at the bottom here, a latest news section. We publish a quarterly newsletter which contains information about the experiences of the fellows. The latest edition, which I previously opened in a separate window, I'm going to pop over here and open that up. That latest edition features the really fascinating subject of astrobiology demonstrated by Trinity Hamilton's research with NASA Astrobiology Institute. It also includes a report 
on the value of the NPP experience by a fellow who recently completed his, his appointment at the Ames Research Center. And this edition of the newsletter takes a look at a chemical engineering study by a fellow, NPP fellow at NASA uh, Langley Research Center. And finally, it's got a short uh, segment on the NASA Goddard Association for Postdoctoral Studies, what NASA is doing with their postdoctoral community there at Goddard. Well, now I'm going to go back to the home page and click on some of the links under the banner at the top of the page here, give you an idea about what's available behind each of these things. So we'll look at this first link here about MPP. What you're going to see here is a short, brief overview of the program description, eligibility information, which I covered in the presentation, the application review criteria, a link to the NASA research opportunities. This is the catalog I talked about, and we'll look at that in detail a little bit later. And then there's some information about the NASA centers. So if you're not familiar with the NASA centers, you may want to look at this part of the website so you can find out more about the NASA, each of the NASA centers. And there's links to the home pages for each one of them there. Under the Meet the Fellows link, this is where you're going to find lists of all the fellows, both current and past, research experiences of the fellows. Those are interesting stories of, of the fellows describing their research and the path they took to arrive at the NASA postdoc program. And then a section on awards and recognition earned by the various fellows. Now the fellows and advisors link, that provides information for current participants. The eligibility link simply repeats what we've seen before. And the apply link, now that brings you to a fairly long page that describes the procedures for applying for a fellowship. I'll just click on that one now. I'll scroll down, scroll down this page and you can, see, you can see what's on here. And when you register, one thing you need to do is register before applying. And when you register to apply, use your primary email address because all future NPP correspondence will be sent to that address. Once you've registered, you can return your application at any time. You do not have to complete the application in one session. It's a session section on identifying a research opportunity. This will be one of the first steps in applying. In fact, you can search the opportunities to find out if NPP is for you before you register to apply. A long section on the steps in completing the application a section on arranging for your references, a section that describes the components of the research proposal, which I briefly described in my presentation, and then some information about the graduate degree transcripts. Now, because graduate degree transcripts can vary widely depending on the university, especially US versus foreign universities, we've provided a fair amount of detail about this requirement. First of all, a transcript is an official report of the academic record of a student by the university. It provides the title of the course completed, credit hours or duration of the course, grades, marks, subject evaluations received by the student, academic status or honors, and then the degrees conferred. Certificates, diplomas, or announcements to indicate that an applicant has received a PhD are not sufficient because they do not capture the details of the applicant's PhD preparation or they don't describe the academic performance of the applicant. Official copies of the transcript, transcripts must be sent directly to our office from the granting institution. Transcripts sent by the applicant to us will not be accepted. PhD transcripts are required even if the PhD is not yet completed. Without a PhD transcript, we have no proof that the applicant is even enrolled in a PhD program. So even if you haven't completed your degree, you must request that the university send a PhD transcript to our office. Although it's not required, we recommend that applicants also submit transcripts for the master's degree, if applicable. This information gives the peer reviewer, reviewers a more complete understanding of the applicant's academic record. Transcripts from foreign universities 
must be accompanied by an official English translation. Translations by the applicant cannot be accepted. Finally, transcripts must be received no later than the application deadline. It is the applicant's responsibility to make sure that we have received them by the application deadline. Now, at the bottom of this, here's the information about where you have the transcript sent to. The bottom of this page is a link to proceeding to the online application. But before we click on that button, I'm going to, for demonstration purposes, scroll back up to the section entitled Identify a Research Opportunity, and I'm going to click on the link of Search the Opportunities. And what we're doing now, we're loading the Research Opportunities catalog so that I can browse it or search it to find a research project that matches my skills and interests. Okay, it's loaded now, so you'll see on the on the uh, right side of the screen over here in this dark green box that there are 730 research opportunities in the catalog at this time. The opportunities are updated whenever we receive a request from the NASA Center, which may be daily. So anytime we post a new research opportunity, it shows up on Twitter and Facebook. So you can follow the quote NASA postdoctoral program on Facebook to see when a new opportunity is posted and to stay abreast of other interesting facts about the program and NASA in general. Over on the left-hand side of the page here, you can see uh, a, a number of boxes here to initially subset the opportunities. For example, let's say I want to consider opportunities only at the Ames Research Center. So I'll click on that box. Now it's going to display only those opportunities at the Ames Research Center, which is 124 you see over here on the right-hand side of the screen. I'm interested in climate studies, so I'll enter the keyword climate in the keyword search box. All right, this narrowed the number of opportunities down to 13. I want to narrow my options even more. Since, so since I'm really interested in how aerosols affect climate, I'm going to enter the word aerosols after the word climate in the keyword box. It brought it down to two opportunities. Okay, now that I've kind of got it down into the area that I'm interested. Now I want to look at those opportunities. So I come over here on the right side and click the button here to see the opportunity. You're going to see a, sh a description of the, uh, the title, where it's at. Here are the advisors. There's two advisors associated with this particular opportunity, Dr. Redmond and Dr. Russell. It, every opportunity indicates uh, citizenship requirements. Uh, I think that probably the vast majority of the opportunities we have listed on the website are open to everyone, with the exception of at Goddard Space Flight Center, we have that uh, designated country restriction list. So you know, if you're from uh, one of those countries, then you'll have to select a, a, a fellowship from one of the other NASA centers. You'll see a short description of the research program being done there at this, for this particular opportunity, and then some references. So you can look that over. And if it turns out that you think this is something that you're interested in, interested in, then what I would want you to do or what I suggest you do is you contact the advisors, either one or both of them, introduce yourself and, uh, and, and uh, learn more about what's going on from them and, and find out whether or not this makes sense for you to apply, as a, a, apply for a fellowship to work with that particular advisor. I'm going to close this box. I'm going to take a quick look at this one by Dr. Strawa, because actually that one almost looks better for me since it's studies of aerosol effects on climate using satellite data. Same sort of format laid out for every one of these opportunities. So you can contact as many advisors as you want, but you can apply for only one opportunity per application, application cycle. And when you find an opportunity that matches your skills and interests, and you get a positive reply from the advisor, then just simply go ahead and begin the application. I see I'm getting rather short on time here, so I'm going to move along and try to move along here a little bit. I'm going to pop back over to the application page, and I'm going to click on the online application on the left-hand side of the page here. So I've registered in the past. log back in. OK, 
Okay, so now I'm in the application system. This page contains a section for completing the application, arranging for your references, and submitting your application. Now these three sections correspond to the first three links under the banner up here. Now you should arrange your references as soon as possible so that they have plenty of time to provide the recommendations. So let's look at that section first. I'm going to click on Request References. I've already entered three references into the system, and I can add as many as I want. Anytime you add a reference to the system, an email is automatically sent to that, to, sent to that person telling them what's going on, that you are, you are requesting a, a uh, reference for you to support your application to the NASA postdoctoral program. As people submit their references, you can see that Dr. Pointer, my thesis advisor, has submitted the reference. These other two people haven't submitted references yet. So I can resend the request if I want myself, or since it's actually a, a fair amount of time yet for them to get their information, I might just say, I'm going to give them some more time, and I'll go on to other parts of the application. So I'm going to come back up and say, I'm going to leave the references alone for now, and I'm going to say, let's complete other parts of the application. On this page, you'll see boxes over on the left-hand side, the various components of the application. Seems daunting, but it's actually very easy broken up into these components. Each section has a little box in front of it indicating, let's say, for example, if it has a red arrow in it, it says started but not completed. If the green check mark in it, that section is completed. If there's nothing in it, it hasn't been started at all. So I'm going to start with this very top one, Research Opportunity. It shows me which one I previously accepted. I selected, but you know, I, as I read through Redmond's and, and, and talked with Dr. Redmond, talked to Russell, I said, I think, I think Dr. Strawwell would be better, so I can simply go back, select a different opportunity. Until you actually submit the application, you can change any of this information. So I'm back at the page again. Put in Strawwell. There's Dr. Strawwell's opportunity. I can view that. I can select it, and actually, I think, let me scroll up here, there we go, and I must, in this case, there's only one advisor associated with the opportunity, so I simply select him. You'll note that in some cases, many cases, multiple advisors, so you actually select a particular advisor you want to work with. Okay, I've selected that one. I'm going to continue. Applicant profile information is complete. My contact information, I'm missing something there. It has a red line in it. And I see, as I scroll down here, I look at my contact information. And well, I've got the city, the state, zip code. But one thing I didn't put in was my address. So I'll just put in one, two, three, just for simplicity, and move on. Now my Contact information is complete. My education history is complete. You can follow the instructions on every segment and tell you exactly what to do. Honor and more. I didn't do anything about employment yet, but you know, I don't really have any employment history I'd like to enter, so I'm going to just say, no, I don't have anything. Now the employment section is done. Citizenship information? Yeah, uh, you foreign nationals, um, enter birth country, your city, First citizenship, many people, foreign nationals, have second citizenship. Are you a lawful permanent resident? I'm a U.S. citizen. Simply click, click that, move on. That section's done. Research experience. This is an opportunity for you to enter up to 1,200 words about your research experiences, who you've collaborated with, significant research relevant to the opportunity which you've chosen. Well, in my case, I can do anything at any time. Huh, so that's a little joke. <laughs> research proposal, that's the big part of the application. I put my title in. I have, uh, haven't uploaded the proposal yet. You simply uh, upload a PDF file of your proposal. Uh, there are some questions down here that are optional that you can fill in about your research needs. List your publications, your dissertation abstract, demographics. So once you've completed all that information, we'll go up to verify and submit. And it says, oh, I don't have my research proposals completed yet and I haven't received all my references. So I can click on that, I can say, well, what am I missing? There's the page where I'm missing. So I've got to get to work and get some, get some uh, references uh, submitted. Once you have uh, 
have all of that information completed, you then can because I have parts of it uncompleted yet, I cannot, uh, the, the submit button is not displayed. So um, that's, that's pretty much in, it, in a nutshell. As you saw, it's, it's pretty easy to apply. So since I'm running short, I think I'll say that concludes my presentation. And I want to thank each of you for participating in the webinar today. And I encourage you all to tell your colleagues about the NASA postdoctoral program. I'm going to turn it back to you, Jennifer. OK, thank you, Larry. So we'll now move to the final set of polling questions. And I will give these questions a minute or two for, for everyone to take a look at them and answer them. And then we'll move to the question and answer period. OK, so make sure you stay on the line and or in the meeting room to participate in the question and answer period. We actually have quite a few um, questions. OK, so we will extend the question period to 11.15 for those of you who can stay on the line. All right, so I'll give this just another uh, minute and a half or so. So don't forget, folks, we're taking the questions in just another uh, 30 seconds or so, OK? Okay, everybody, we're going to go ahead and move to the question and answer period. And um, just give me a moment here. We've got quite a few, so I'll need to um, see, start from the top. Okay. One thing I do want to say really quick, we do have uh, not only the webinars on our YouTube channel, but we will have a data center search order um, tools posted on our YouTube channel. We also have a Facebook account and a Twitter account. And what we do is we try to highlight data products and data tools across the earth science disciplines, OK? Um, so connect with us. We'd love to hear from you. All right, let's see here. A few people asked about the presentation. As you see here in the lower right-hand um, corner of the screen, the presentation is available for download, not only right now, but uh, will be a persistent feature so that you can download it after the webinar is complete by listening to the recording at another time, OK? So um, it will be posted on the YouTube channel as well as to our tinyurl.com site above. OK, so the first question is, uh, can an international student start the postdoc uh, with OPT, optional practical training, instead of a J-1 visa? Larry? OK, yeah, I, I, that's a very good question. Um, 
you know, has, does not allow a foreign national to uh, start the fellowship with the OPT, with the F1 OPT. And the reason for that is uh, because these fellowships, even though they're, they are um, granted for one year at a time, they fully expect them to be at least two years. Um, NASA does not want to start someone on a fellowship, only have them interrupted 12 to 18 months into the appointment to change the visa status. In many cases, the visa status can change it from an F1 to a J1 pretty quickly, but sometimes there are, there are delays of weeks. And so uh, they have chosen to say that uh, uh, participants or fellows must uh, receive the J-1 Scholar Visa status before beginning the fellowship. Actually, let me comment also, in many cases, foreign nationals who are here in the U.S. University under an F-1, in many cases, when they complete their degree, they're ready to go home, back to their, their home country, for a visit anyway. So it works out quite well for them when they go back home to visit their family and friends, and they apply for the J-1 Research Scholar Visa status in their home country and re-enter the U.S. with the J-1. Okay? Okay, thank you, Larry. There was also a, um, a comment, and I'm not sure if there was a specific question, um, by Chaz for slide nine. So um, I could actually pull that up again if we need to. Um, did you want to summarize perhaps the points on slide nine, Larry? Do you, well, are you able to do that without me pulling up um, the presentation again? Uh, you know, Jennifer, I, I apologize. I am not able to do that. I did not bring a copy of the presentation with me. In That's the okay. Um, let's Sorry. see if, let me see if I can uh, get there real quickly here. Hold on just a moment. We'll go back. Okay. So, okay, Chaz, now. if you have a specific question on this slide, let me know what it is. Slide nine. Um, oh, okay, it was a technical problem. Okay, I gotcha. All right, well, let's go ahead and move back to um, the end here. The next question was um, from an end user, Larry, and the question is, what are the tax implications for the fellows? Okay, you know, the fellowship stipends are taxable, and what you're required to pay there is the federal income tax. Now, state income tax is required if that center is located within a state that has a state income tax. For instance, if you held a fellowship at the Kennedy Space Flight Center in Florida, there is no state income tax because Florida has no state income tax. Um, Foreign nationals, uh, tax implication for foreign nationals is, is uh, can be quite complicated. Uh, it depends upon the treaty the U.S. has with each individual country. So I can say at this point because there are so many different uh, countries involved in this program. But uh, that information, as much information as we could put, is on the website. Uh, and then, of course, what you can do is email your questions directly to us, your particular situation, and can address it uh, in a better manner that way since, since there are so many countries involved. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Larry. The next question um, is also um, a comment, combined question. So this individual has indicated they passed peer review but haven't been funded yet. How, what percent will be selected in the next round? Well, that's a very difficult question for me answer. I'm, I'm sorry. Um, I, but but it, it does remind me of something that I needed to bring up, is that when you have applied, let's say in this particular case this individual has applied, they have passed peer review, have not received an offer yet. Now that application is actually valid for a period of one year from the application date. So there's no need for that person to go back and reapply for that same opportunity. He or she may reapply re 
apply for the same opportunity if they wish, but there's no guarantee that you're going to get a higher score. Um, you keep in mind that these applications are reviewed by peer reviewers. Um, you may or may not get a higher score. Uh, people who have applied in the past, you may request the reviewer's comments on the application. Once you see the reviewer's comments, you may be able to use that to improve your proposal and therefore end up with a higher score. But your, your application is good for one year. So NASA centers have, in many cases, gone back to previous applications and selected them all the way back to just like 11 or 12 months from the time of application. Okay. Thank you, Larry. The next question um, is also, you know, there's also some uh, comment here. I am from Iran and I am a PhD student here in the U.S. with an F1 visa. Right now I am a consultant in the NASA developed program at Marshall Space Flight Center. This individual is an intern. I will finish my PhD next summer. I would like to know if I can apply for the postdoc. Uh, yeah is on the designated countries list, but all that means is that you're not able to accept a fellowship or apply for a fellowship appointment at the Goddard Space Flight Center. You can apply for fellowships at the other NASA centers, so it is possible for you to apply for a postdoc fellowship at the Marshall Space Flight Center, even though you are from Iran. Uh, it is entirely up to the center um, of how they want to handle um, um, uh, situations uh, with fellows from foreign countries. Uh, if the research opportunity on the website, you know, from the Space Center indicates that foreign nationals are accepted, then yes, you can apply. Okay, thanks, Larry. The next question is, when was the program's inception? Okay, you know, NASA has, has had a postdoc program for uh, decades, uh, many, many decades. And initially, and until 2005, the program was managed by the National Research Council, the National Academy of Science National Research Council. Back in 2005, they decided to uh, put the program up for bid, so to speak, and they announced that they were accepting proposals for other agencies and organizations to manage the program. So Oak Ridge Associate Universities was one of the bidders and received the award to manage the postdoc program for NASA. I think one of the reasons why NASA decided to do this, and, and I don't know for sure, but when NRC ran the program, the NASA postdoc part of it was a component of multiple uh, fellowship programs from several federal agencies, so they didn't really have their own brand in there. So NASA really is such a wide uh, agency, a broad agency, well-known agency around the world that they have a very strong brand that I think they felt that they could do as well, if not better, uh, running the program themselves by pulling it out of the NRC. So, so that's a little bit of history behind it. Um, we've been managing the program now for five, uh, nine years. Okay, thanks, Larry. The next question, uh, and actually she has several, but I'll go in order of the questions. Um, Zoe, do you mainly take people with the first postdoc or freshly graduated PhD student? Okay, uh, doesn't make any difference. It just depends upon the quality of the application and the, and the uh, uh, NASA's priorities. So that doesn't enter into the evaluation at all. Okay, thanks, Larry. The next question is, does it re are you required to submit your master's transcript? No, you are not required, but we really suggest that you do it because keep in mind, what you're trying to do is you're trying to educate the peer reviewers to let them know what the breadth of your experience with academic courses are. So we encourage you to do it if you have them. Okay, thank you. Next question, how long are opportunities generally available for? Well, the opportunities are, 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 are there all the time. And let me, let me comment on that, I guess. I mean, that doesn't tell you too much, does it? But uh, these fellowships, it's not a situation like 
like a university may be average let's say a university is advertising for a fellowship position to work on a particular project working with Dr. X. Well, they know that they have a fellowship position to be filled, so they advertise it until it's filled, or they put a cutoff date and it's filled. With the NASA postdoc program, they advertise opportunities, and just because the opportunity is up there doesn't mean they have a position for it. We have over 700 opportunities listed on the website right now. That does not mean we have 700 positions. NASA will make about 90 new awards every year. So the, which opportunities are funded, again, comes back to the quality of the applications that we receive. Okay? Okay, great. The next question is uh, more so of a, a combined comment question. I have an official translation of my master transcripts. Can I send them myself, or should they be sent by the university? No, if there's some way that it's indicated on that it is, quote, official, has been through a translation agency, then I believe you can send that to our office yourself. Okay, great. Next question. Does the relocation assistance also extend to partners for families? For example, assisting partners finding job opportunities. Yes, if the partner is a legal spouse or legal children. It can't be a situation where I have a live-in friend and that friend wants to be moved with me. It must be someone who is a uh, legal spouse. Okay, thank you, Larry. The next question is, is the proposal prepared in cooperation with the advisor or alone? You know, it, it really should be you, uh, the, the applicant, uh, developing the ideas. Uh, that does not mean that you cannot ask the advisor to give you some feedback during the proposal preparation. How much feedback you get, of course, depends upon the person you're interacting with. The advisor cannot be writing the research proposal, but they can certainly provide you feedback. Now, some, are, some advisors are very willing to, some are very reluctant. Um, you know, that goes back to the personality of people. Okay, thank you, Larry. The next question is, will NASA support an H-1B visa for internationals? No, I'm sorry, we, we cannot support any H-1B status in the program. Okay, next question. Can I start the program if I have been before in the U.S. on a J-1 visa? I, if you can uh, demonstrate that you can be on a J-1 visa status in the U.S. again for a minimum of, say, two and a half years, then you can. We have situations in, in which we maybe had someone, a foreign national in the U.S., who is on a fellowship, let's say, for two years at the University of Chicago. Now they've applied here and six months have gone by. Now they've been in the U.S. two and a half. You know, they extended their fellowship in Chicago for six months and they want to start the NASA one. Well, you got two and a half years left on your visa stat, J-1 visa status. You know, if you can demonstrate that you have enough time left on your visa status to complete your t minimum two-year appointment, then I believe the NASA Center would uh, very seriously consider uh, making an offer in that situation. Okay, thank you, Larry. The next question is, could you please provide the link to the NPP website again? I can type it in uh, and send it out to everybody. What is the, the link, Larry? Okay, yeah, that, that would be good. Um, it's orau.org slash... Yeah, let me, it is, it is, it is, um, excuse me. It's nasa.orau.org slash postdoc. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and send that out to everybody. All right, next question, uh, comment. I believe I cannot submit proposals for two different opportunities in the same selection period. If I am not accepted, can I reapply for the next period? Is there a waiting time to reapply? No, you can, you can apply for one opportunity for every application deadline. Um, no, no restrictions. Now, if you have been an NPP fellow in the past, you must wait a minimum of five years before reapplying. But that means you have already been an NPP fellow, then you wait five 
five years and then you can reapply. But if you've never been a fellow, and you apply, let's say, by the July 1st deadline. Um, you go ahead and start an application in August for the, for the November 1st deadline if you wish. It's entirely up to you. One application per deadline. That's it. Okay, thanks, Larry. And the next question is a follow-up to the earlier question, and it is, uh, can I apply for the program if I have been before in the U.S. on J-1 visa and still under the two years home residence condition? Well, if you're under the home residence condition, um, you know, if you're, let me, just, let me just put it this way. If you get the J-1 visa uh, status as a research scholar to be in the U.S. for a minute or two years, then I would say you're, it's fine to apply. You start getting into the home restriction rule, um, you know, I, I, I really can't comment on, on that. In other words, if, if, you are, if you are under that and you need to be back in your U.S back in your home country for two years, well, then you'll have to wait two years. You will not be able to get back into the U.S. until the two years are up. Okay, thanks, Larry. Okay. So I'm looking here, and I don't see, does anybody have any other questions? Any additional questions here? Go ahead and feel free to type those in at this time. I'll give it just another minute or two. And um, then what we'll do, uh, if there are no further questions, we will leave the, the meeting room open for you know another 10 minutes or so for those of you who are interested in downloading the agenda or the presentation. Um, feel free to uh, email me if you have any questions and I will forward those along to Larry or contact them directly through their website. Um, and we'll, you know, we'll log off from the telecon if there are no further questions. So I think I've captured everybody's questions. Um, as I'm looking up here. If I miss something and you're still on the line, please let me know, okay? Uh, all right, well, thank you, everybody, for joining us today. It was great to have you in this meeting. Uh, our next uh, webinar is actually going to be focused on our Global Hydrology Resource Center at Marshall. And um, that will be held on, regularly scheduled on Wednesday, June 25th at 2 p.m. Eastern Time. So if you're interested in uh, signing up to our mailing list to receive announcements for upcoming webinars, um, there's a link to a mailing list on at the tinyurl.com or data webinar. And thanks to all of you. All right, I don't see any more questions. So this concludes our webinar. We'll now uh, end the telecon portion, but I'll leave the room open, okay? Thanks, everybody.